The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're traveling to Detroit, Michigan for the Maker Fair 2015. At the fair, we have arranged for various makers to stop by our booth and show off their projects. I'm going to judge each project from one to 10 based off the following factors. The cool factor, the initial vibe I get from the project. Usefulness, after the cool factor wears off, is the project actually useful to people? What purpose does it serve? Manufacturability, could the project be duplicated at a reasonable cost, time, and labor? And finally, market potential, would somebody actually buy it? Could you get funding to go have it manufactured? While I'm checking out these projects, Felix will be giving you updates on what's happening around the fair. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspired designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Bad damn hatches! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Oh no, I'm turning into a cyborg thanks to Scott Shiraga. What is this, Scott? This is a Nintendo Power Glove uh, that I modified to be a... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I can fly. To be a complete interface uh, for a wearable computer. Now, the Power Glove is kind of a laughing point in video game history, but it has some cool tech in it. Yeah. There were bend sensors? Yeah. So it can tell if you're bending your finger. Yep. Is that like piezos, or how do they do um, it? Yeah, it's really um, like the same flex sensors that you could probably find on a lot of different websites out there today. Um, that the more you bend your finger, the more resistance um, there is. So it's actually analog. Yes, it is analog. Um, and the way the Arduino processes it is there's like 123 steps, I think. Um, and what I did with this project is I made a threshold values. So you increase that number by a certain amount, it registers as a click, as a button okay. press. And then uh, you're not using the sonar from the power glove at I'm all? I'm not. Um, but I just kind of like left the sonar sensors in there just to maintain appearance. Well, yeah, it looks cool. So yeah. on the power glove, you'd put this black bar across your television. Hmm, just like the Wii, huh? And it would actually um, communicate with this ultrasonically and that's how it would know where it was in space. So there was some cool tech in this back in the day. Yeah. All right, and then this is going to simulate a mouse. It's yes. got a little thumbstick here. Yeah, but I think it's actually um, a yeah, PSP 1000 joystick. Is that okay, actual yeah. Name? So I kind of hooked that in um, to the digital inputs on the, on the um, Arduino Micro. So what are the goggles all about? Okay, so the goggles are part of, or they used to be part of a MyView Crystal uh, video glasses. So the idea, the original idea with the MyView Crystal is you have two of them, and you just kind of put it over your eyes so you could kind of see below, you could have half your vision beyond the, um, look outwards, but half of it would be these two screens. And the idea is you'd hook this up to an iPod and you could just watch movies on an airplane. Um, so I borrowed this idea from a guy named Martin Magnuson um, on Hackaday, and I just kind of implemented the idea, and essentially you see, instead of, say, Google Is it Glass, running? Can I try Yeah, it's it? running. Yeah, let me just double check. Yeah, so you're on the desktop right now. Cable's kind of short. Oh! I'm gonna put in my earphone, too, so I can <laughs> save the president's dog. Oh, that's cool! All right, so you should be able to move the mouse now. Oh, there it goes. Oh, and so I can click the mouse using my. I'm yeah, getting quite a good line of sight here. Let me I kind just, of naturally just. Yeah, um, I got to move quickly. the mouse to something. Sure. And of course, there's no way the cameras can see what I'm seeing. <laughs> but just imagine a full desktop um, and yeah. essentially a mouse you can control. Um, I will say the joystick is very zippy. So I find more often than not, I pull my ring finger, um, which is precision mode. Oh, okay. Oh, let me try that. Oh, yeah, yeah that's much better. Control. Um, also, Ben, on your wrist, um, you have a full keyboard. How do you interface to this? That, I think it's a four pin audio jack. Um, goes into main unit here, which I guess I can open up fast. That's not gonna electrocute me, is it? No. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, if that battery electrocutes me, I guess I have other problems. Okay. Yeah, so inside here, and I admit more duct tape, but- uh, there, It's a Raspberry Pi, you said? Yeah, there's a Raspberry Pi, and this is um, the control unit for, um, that came with the glasses. Um, there was actually a, um, a LiPo battery pack inside here um, that had really bad battery life. 
So I kind of, I just hooked it up, or I soldered some wires in, hooked it up to the main pack. Could um, you have so like two directions of? Uh, oh, like a 3D mouse? Yeah, like a virtual mouse. I guess. I mean, if you put a gyro sensor up in the thumb, I mean, there definitely is room on, like, on the above the plastic. Yeah, yeah, that might be cool. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Let's review the power glove. Cool factor. Well, it definitely makes you look like you're from the future, or a Borg. I guess Borgs are from the future, so it's the same thing. For cool factor, I give the Power Glove an eight. Usefulness. Microsoft is pursuing the HoloLens, so the basic concept of computer as eyes must have some merit. On the fly or hands-free information can be useful in a variety of situations, from car servicing to surgery. Some might argue that's the same thing. The trick is to make it as unobtrusive as possible. So as a concept, I'd give Power Glove a six. Manufacturability. You'd have to use a Google Glass type part for the display and also a separate pack for the CPU and battery. The glove would, of course, have to be simplified. So this device has a total of three main parts. Eyes, pack, glove. This increases difficulty and cost. Manufacturability for the Power Glove, I'd have to rate a four. Market potential. Augmented reality probably has more real world productivity applications going forward than virtual reality, so it's a good area to explore for business. For market potential, I'd give the concept of the Power Glove computer a seven. Now let's take a break from this and see what Felix has been up to. Well, here we are at the Mega Fair 2015, and while Ben's inside doing the Hacktik Roadshow, Max and I are out here checking out the sites. There have been some explosions and a lot of really big things. Look at this huge locomotive. A huge Hot Wheels loop. A mega operation game. A really huge cupcake. A really big rocket. After we got done looking at all the big things, we followed R2-D2 back to the Star Wars booth and met up with Kurt Zimmerman and listened to what he had to say. So tell me, what do you do to get these things together here? Well, it, there's a lot of different ways to build an R2-D2. You can, you can go all aluminum, you can build it out of wood, you can build it out of paper, you can build it out of anything you want to build it out of, okay. as long as it looks right on the outside. Yeah. Most of them that are built are uh, radio controlled. This one was built to go to, we go to schools and hospitals, things mm -hmm. like that. We do a lot of visits. Um, we do a few sporting events, things like that. But uh, as you can see by the reaction that we get from the kids here, that they, they just love it. What do you got to do to become a member of the RTD2 Builders All Club? All you do is you go on astromech.net and you sign up and you're in the club. That is really great. Thanks a lot, Mr. Zimmerman. Hey, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Our next guest is Ken Burns from Ohio. Hi, Ben. Thanks nice for coming you. on the show. Thank you. Now, it looks like either we've grown astronomically in size or you've shrunken these cabinets down to miniature levels. I think it's a combination of both, actually, after <laughs> last night's dinner. But, yeah, so, yeah, we've got all sorts of uh, little miniature circuits, or you might call them tiny circuits. And uh, we actually make these down in Ohio. And so, There's a little joystick and everything. A little joystick. And actually, if you see here, this is actually a Space Invaders game that works. Oh, sweet. So it's a really tiny arcade cabinet. Do Is you the button not working? These are, these are uh, 4D OLEDs, right? They're, they're OLEDs. Yeah, it's like 96 by 64 pixels. How did you program this? Is there a um, controller as well, or do you use the uh, operating? Yeah, so we, we, oh, we actually a... make this. This is what we call Tiny Duino. It's basically... Oh, I have one of those. OK, good. Well, so you're familiar. It's basically an Arduino yes. Uno, the size of a quarter. And all the different boards just kind of stack together, almost like little Legos. So that's a USB plug on there. And so right. that combined is basically like an Arduino Uno, so you can program that using the same Arduino And then you IDE. can take off the programmer when you're done programming right. it because you don't need this part anymore. Exactly. And this will mate with a... Uh... Yeah, so we... Do you make I... these as well, or are these yeah. are stock? Oh, you do. Yeah, so the, the OLED we're, we're sourcing, uh, but then we do the circuit board. And so it's got power supplies and some side switches on there. Oh, this is really cool. I bought one of your tiny circuits a couple years ago. I haven't done anything with it yet, but it is on my pegboard. Okay, great. So now I have some good inspiration. I'm sorry, so what, uh, what else would you want to tell me about that right there? I mean, we've got a bunch of, we've got about 40 different boards, different sensors and whatnot, but the screen, we actually did a Kickstarter campaign around this last year. And so that did really well and people really like the screen for wearables or- How much is the screen? $25. Oh, that's really reasonable. Yeah. That's actually pretty good. I mean, that's, yeah, the 4D system screen like that would be mm -hmm. like, what, 50 usually? So. Yeah. 
So you did a Kickstarter to get enough money to do a big run from China? Right, so we we basically built up about 2,500 units of the screens. Okay. So yeah, we, we sourced the screens, the batteries, you were checking out earlier, sourced those as well. So it's a tiny little LiPo. How long would this LiPo run that screen in that uh, AT Mega? If it's running like this, about four or five hours. That's not too bad. But, Does uh, this pop open? Yeah. Oh. So that's, that's all 3D printed. So oh, you even have LEDs for the marquee. Yeah, it's a little light in here, so you can't see it too well. There it is. Basically, you made these as a cool way to show off a usage for your tiny circuits. Exactly. Awesome. And also, potentially, um, I mean, we released the 3D files so people can go make this themselves if mm -hmm. they want to. And long term, we'd like to actually make this into a kit that people you know, we could sell. Uh, so we probably, we're looking to you know, combine some of these boards into one and make it a little more cost effective and hopefully get it down around $50, $75 for yeah, a kit. Yeah, the connectors add up on these. The connectors add up and just all the different boards. Cool. Well, I'll definitely stop by the Maker Shed and take a look at that screen module. Great. Thanks, all right. Ben. Well, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, thank you. Let's review the Tiny Arcade. Cool factor. Fairly useless, but man, did they look awesome. It would be a great gift for the arcade lover to put on their work desk. I'd give the Tiny Arcade a cool factor of nine. Usefulness. Almost entirely a novelty item, but they are pretty cute, and it does in fact function. Still, I'd have to give the Tiny Arcade a usefulness rating of just two. Manufacturability. It uses existing interlocking components from the same company, so assembly is straightforward and already sourced. Mini Arcade Cabinet requires 3D printing at the moment, which is kind of a negative, but improvements are being made, which include laser cut pieces, which are faster to make. Fairly straightforward overall, so I'd give the Tiny Arcade a manufacturability rating of seven. Market potential. If they had officially licensed decent versions of games, I see this as something you could easily sell at a 50 to $75 price point. Therefore, I'd give Tiny Arcade a market potential rating of seven. Okay, now it's time to check in with Felix and his exploration of Detroit Maker Faire. The Rena Cylon. This is the kind of artwork I want to have in my home. What a masterpiece. What's your name, sir? Uh, my name's Bacon. Um, most people call me that. Right. My mom calls me Joshua. Okay, great. And what do you have here? Uh, this is the Apocalypse Camaro we have here with All us right. today. Where did you make this? Uh, this was made at Recycle here in Detroit, uh -huh. which is a recycling center where like, the people bring in materials to be recycled. and. They're fortunately have enough space there to give us art space, so we built it there as an art project there. So, what do you have in your barrels? Uh, the barrels right now are empty. Um, they often sometimes have water in it, but we wanted to trade out lovely models instead of carrying oh. the weight capacity for water. Today. I thought maybe you had mother's milk or something. No, 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 no. <laughs> you going to Gastown? Uh, you know what? We had to go to Gastown before we got out here. Oh, so, yeah. uh, you know, the nice thing is, is that these V8s are sippers, not drinkers. That's a lie. This thing guzzles gas. <laughs> and then uh, it says we built the new air cleaner. It, it only sucks it down more. You can actually hear it sucking in all the water, all the air and burning all the fuel. So maybe I should switch out those water tanks for fuel tanks. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Bacon. Now, have a great day and not a problem. Yeah. We've taken a short hike across the Henry Ford Museum to come to the Total Geekdom booth where you're building Lego computers. Yes. And your name is Mike Schropp. Yes. How's it going? Good. Tell us more about what you've created here. Uh, well, there's two systems. Um, one is the uh, micro Lego computer. Okay. You can see it's smaller in size in comparison. That's the mini Lego computer. Mini, micro. Yep. Just like USB cords. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the computer is basically built around a uh, Intel Nook uh, platform. Nook. Yeah. Uh, it's a. It stands for Next Unit of Computing. Okay. Um, small little motherboard, uh, four inch by four inch, but. A lot of the features of modern computers, you can put Linux on it, um, so whatever whatever flavor of OS suits you, you can put them, I put them all on there. Is it, uh, what, what speed does it run at? Uh, the uh, the processor? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't heard of this form factor before, oh, so I'm yeah, curious it's, about uh, it. There's, a, there's an i3, an i5, an i7, oh. um, so you can get various different versions. 
the i3, I think the base is 1.6 gigahertz. Uh, there's a 2 gigahertz i5, a 2.2 i7. Dual core? Uh, yeah, they're all dual core. Okay. Um, That's basically, not bad. it's very similar. It's the processors that come in most Ultrabooks now. They've just put the same form factor into something that they sell in a little different version. That's the kind of stuff I like. <laughs> so, basically, it's a it's a fully fledged you know desktop computer that you can use to do anything. With integrated you, graphics. Yep, integrated graphics. How much RAM can you put on it? Uh, you can put 16 gigabytes of RAM. Okay. Uh, what form factor for the RAM? Uh, it's uh, so dim. Okay. So laptop uh, RAM basically. Um, it's got space for one one SSD. Uh, it's a MSATA style. So it's a great candidate for one of your microcomputers. Yeah, perfect. So what first inspired you to do this? Well, I built a system probably almost five years ago now that was a kind of towering hulk for myself uh, of a system that was three computers full. Uh, ATX motherboards inside of a big giant Lego case that was 20 inches by 20 inches by 20 inches. Why were there three computers? I, I'm pretty big into grid computing, um, so I was trying to combine all of these computers I had into one form factor, and I'm also, as you can see, quite into Lego. Were they three different computers? Yeah, yep. okay. so three individual um, motherboards, processors, coolers, drives, um, multiplied out, all structured in a big giant case. And uh, I put that together, I put it on my website because people were interested in it, and from that day forward, I've been building custom LEGO computers for people ever since. That sounds like what happened with my website many years ago. It's, <laughs> it's amazing how that works. So if you got a good idea, put it on the internet. <laughs> and this is a more powerful version. It looks like you have a more standard uh, micro ATX. Yep, yep, that is a, uh, um, the, the mini version uses uh, desktop processors, um, socketed stuff. Uh, it, can, it can take up to 16 gigabytes of RAM as well. Um, there's. It's basically a, a significantly more powerful version just because of the uh, processing. Oh, that's a uh, vent. Yep, yep. Those are placed just off the top of the surface there, and they allow the uh, air intakes uh, to be drawn in directly over the top of the motherboard. So it's quite effective at cooling because it's such a small air space as compared to a conventional case where you have a big giant space of air to cool. Do the Legos seal well enough that you can force the air in the direction you want it to go without leakage? Yep, yep. It's actually when, when the thing's up at, at higher temp and the fans are going at a, at a faster RPM, you can feel around the perimeter of the case those slots that pass around the side there those are actually exhaust vents oh yeah I can a series see that. of events in the back as well oh that's very clear you're able to put the exhaust vents into the style of the case yep. instead of like having just big gaping holes like yep. oh great I guess that's the exhaust vent yeah I didn't want to ruin the brick aesthetic and this is an alternate top that you have yep yep there's a couple alternate tops um, that, that are available as well as I've done a lot of custom tops um, you know basically it replaces the top that's on there pops in place, uh, there's same little vent kind of Yeah, yeah, the cars there. are indented, but then there's vents around yep, them. So air can get down in there. So all the cases have that option where you can add different tops. Do you draw up your designs in CAD or anything, or you just kind of go for it? I just kind of wing it. So have you been into, I've, I assume you've been into Legos your whole life? Basically, since a kid. Uh, what are these modules here, the blue um, and the red modules? These, these modules are add-on modules for the microsystem, and they're, oh. built, they're both in the same scale. So this is a uh, card reader and a USB hub, and these, these systems stack together. So Oh, sweet! So you can basically kind of configure so them. So you've used Legos to make Legos. Yes, yeah, exactly. So it's just a scaled-up form factor. They just plug into the back, and then you have a card reader and an external hard drive. Awesome. Yeah, I was wondering why you didn't use more multiple colors, but you're representing an entire Lego piece here. Exactly, exactly. That's very cool. So you can kind of stack them however you want, you know, under, over. Every one of them has the ability to go, you know, on top, on the bottom, whatever configuration kind of suits you. Well, thanks for your time today. Thank you. Okay. I'm very impressed. I like, that's awesome. I, I should buy one. Let's review the Lego computer. Cool factor. Well, it looks cool on a desk. Nice form factor and is x86 to run full-blown Windows or Linux. There's even a gamer edition coming with a dedicated video card. LEGO Computer Cool Factor is an 8. Usefulness. I like the small form factors and clever cooling solutions. What's really neat is how separate computer parts can snap together like LEGO bricks, making this a modular computer, which is something that could be a shot in the arm for desktops. LEGO Computer Usefulness, I give a 7. Manufacturability. At current, seems like kind of a slow process. That is part of the charm, but 3D printed parts or injection molded base assemblies could speed things up without sacrificing look and feel, while adding strength and making it cheaper. Manufacturability of the LEGO computer, I rate just a three.
market potential, not really for the Lego parts, but more for the modularity, configuring home PCs can be a chore for less experienced people. If parts were simple modules that could snap together, that could help a lot. Plus, with things like USB 3.0, eSATA, DisplayPort, and Thunderbolt, it's more likely than ever for standard universal modules to be feasible, even between PC and Mac. <gasps> Imagine that. I rate the LEGO computer's market potential a 9. Cool project, but I wonder what Felix is up to. We're here at the uh, ham radio booth, and uh, what's your call sign, sir? Oh, my call sign, I am Kilo Delta E, Quebec Bravo Alpha. The name is Michael Kirkhart. Awesome. What did you do here? This is the engineering model of one of the first four Pocket Cube class satellites to be launched. Um, his name is um, $50 Sat, though I know you're probably thinking, it's $50 for a satellite? It's more like about $250 worth of parts. Okay. Most of the expense was in these nice $6 per pop uh, triple junction solar cells. Okay, so what's all in there and you got that into orbit? Yes, well not this guy. His yeah. engineering, the, the flight model, his flight model brother has been in orbit since November 21st of 2013. Um, and so it's been about 20 months now. Um, the last, unfortunately, over time, the uh, it's been degrading. Uh, mostly, we, as we found out, it's the uh, solar cells they're getting uh, sputtered to death. Essentially, they're these same cells here, but they don't have any protective cover glass on them. Oh. So what ends up happening is all these high energy particles from the solar wind act like a light sandblasting. And over time, it'll, make, it'll diffuse the uh, surface so light does no longer gets to the active you know, junctions on the cell, so it doesn't generate enough solar power, and therefore the battery is not charged up enough to allow it to transmit. But I did hear it. Last, the last time I heard it was last, uh, last Sunday. Um, yeah, but other than that, it's been basically in continuous operation since. So what's it doing? Okay, this was originally, the idea behind this is since n this was one of the first four of these very small satellites. Nothing, had, nothing to the best of my knowledge had ever been attempted to be built this small before. So it's all the basic questions. Can you build a satellite this small and have it be able to generate its own power, store its own power, and have two-way communication capability? And the answer to all those questions is yes. All right, that was really great, and thank you very much. I'm so glad that you were here and I had the chance to meet you. Okay, cool. That's all the time we have for today. We filmed a lot of things at Detroit Maker Faire 2015, so keep your eyes peeled for a future episode where we'll have even more builds and more of Felix's adventures. In the meantime, you can go to element14.com forward slash TVHS to learn about other upcoming builds, special events, and more. We'll see you next time. You look like some sort of like crazy phantom, like, whoa, I'll put on my cape and run around recording people in the opera. I'm Criswell, I predict man will have colonized Mars. You want one more for safety? Top 10 things. We've now moved away from the Element 14 Hack Geeks Roadshow booth, and now we're literally on the road. That's dumb. <laughs> I will break your back, Batman. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, monkey scientist. We've cut your funding. Out, am I? I don't want to be a statue. <laughs> I'm done now. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.